Hello my friends, John LaRuffy here with another Straight Up Solo. And in this episode, we are gonna take a look at Scholars of the South Tigris. I'm gonna show you how this game plays. I'm gonna show you some a uh, little bit of a run through. I'll talk about the solo bot, of course, because that's what this whole thing's about. And then I will let you know my thoughts. All right, let's get started. Okay, folks, and as usual, please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. If you have, I do really appreciate the report that that support. Thank you so much. Now, this game is about, about translating these scrolls with the help of these translators who are available to hire or dismiss from this marketplace. Once these scrolls get into here, these houses of wisdom, to score points in order to win the game. You also are focusing on upgrading these research tracks, okay, each of them um, representing a different discipline, so to speak. And those will provide you with instant bonuses or bonuses based on when you rest on um, the uh, highest level that you have net or crossed that is opaque here okay like the other um south tigers game you are using dice to modify your actions but in this game you're also coupling them up with these cards and every one of these cards in your hand has two slots for dice one of them which you unlock later in the game will have a printed slot for a five white and you're playing them in this tableau to take these types of actions. There's four types of actions in this game. There's to hire or dismiss the translators. When you dismiss them, you put them in the bottom of the box and you will get whatever the bonus is in the upper right, right here, for instance. When you hire them, you will take them down into this area and you have to pay a certain amount of gold written on the board and then you'll get this reward. But you'll also put your influence marker on them and that is good because that means that they may be used, um, used for you or the bot to translate. And when they're trans they are done, when you pay them enough gold, they retire under your player board where you score points from at the end of the game. Plus, they will give you enhanced actions. Now, in the solo bot, the translate action works a little bit different than it does for you. So I'll talk a little bit about that more in a second. Uh, but that was something that tripped me up a little bit until I uh, got some clarification from the designer himself, which I really appreciate. Thank you, Shem. <clears throat> and so the uh, fact is, is that that's what you're doing with this action right here. You're hiring them or you're dismissing them. Okay. The next thing you could do is you can travel. What you're basically going to do is move around this area and you're going to obtain a scroll or you're going to move on to one of these intermediate areas over here, these minor actions, and just get what the reward is. Once you obtain a scroll, you can bring it over to the House of Wisdom. When you bring it over to the House of Wisdom, it costs four coins, or so four silver, and then you'll get a bonus by um, getting a gold, and then possibly putting on one or even two influence into the uh, House of Wisdom Minaret track over there. Sometimes you'll actually, if you're down here, you have to pay a penalty by adding a white dice to your bag. And a white die to your bag is always a penalty in this game when you're adding it, okay? If you don't put it over here, it's not available to translate. So moving things from here to there is an important part of the game, part, part of the strategy. Then you can do this action over here. And of course, you can do this in any particular order. When you do this action, you will move up on the research tracks, gaining immediate abilities or gaining uh, an ability that will be unlocked for you once you rest. And then finally, you have this action, which is translate. And translate is where you are going to try to take the scroll from this area here. And in order to do that, I'll explain the dice colors and everything in just a second. But you're going to choose the scroll and try to get it from its language all the way back to Arabic. And to do that, you have to pay gold to each one of these translators that you use to loop that around. So for instance, if I wanted to get this Greek contract right here, contract, pardon me, scroll, I would have to find a way to take it from Greek to Arabic. Well, I don't have a Greek to Arabic direct line, but what I do have is I have this Greek to Persian, so I could put a gold on him, but he is owned by the, he's a neutral translator, and in this case, that means the AI owns them, so I'd have to pay a silver to the bank and move this spot, this little marker down one, 
So that would make it so that it went from Greek to Persian. Then I have to get it from Persian to Arabic. Well, that's convenient that I own this translator right here. So I could do that. I would be able to put another gold on this one. And then that would allow me to uh, actually retire the translator, putting them under one of my action sections over here. And if they go into an action section that has nothing under it, it's free. If it has something under it, you have to pay either one silver or put one um, white die in your bag for each thing that's already there. And then that will give you a permanent additional action every time, I shouldn't say necessarily action, but a permanent bonus every time you take that specific action slot. Now, that all seems fairly compa compact. You go from here to here, you go from here to here, you go from here through these guys to there. But it's kind of complicated, to be honest. And then the research track is the most straightforward thing I think about this game. Uh, however, I will say a little spoiler, it is definitely worth the effort. It's worth it to try to figure this out. This is a, van a very, very good game. Okay, so now what are all these colors in the dice doing in the pips and how does that work? Well, some of the cards rec uh, require you to have a specific number of pips on your one or two actions, or sorry, one or two dice slots that you put in here. So for instance, in order to employ these guys, you have to have either one or more, three or more, five or more, seven or more pips on the card you're using, which will go right here, <clears throat> to get them either to dismiss or to put them down here. So that requires a total number of dice. When you're moving, each space you move requires one pip. However, if you happen to have a color of dice that translates into one of these that you move across, like for instance, if I use this blue die, then I would get whatever is in that space right there. And that would be a little bonus. Over here, it depends on both the color and the number what I can do. So any, any value of any color die, I could always do just get one worker and one silver. If I have four or more and I spend a gold of a colored die, not a white one, I can choose whichever one of these tracks lines up exactly with my color and I can then move it up one plus I get two silver. If I have eight or more in the value of that color, I don't have to pay the gold. I would then link it up with the color of dice that I used and then go up and get to two silver. And if I have 10, I can pay two gold and go up twice on my color matching track plus get the silver. Now the color interesting, th the color situation here, I'll explain in just a second. But the final thing here is if I want to translate one of these, I have to have the color matching the specific uh, minaret that I'm dealing with, either uh, purple, orange, or green. The value doesn't matter. So just one more time, value only, value and enhance with color, color and value, and then color only, okay? Now, how do these dice get changed? Well, that's what these workers are for. So if you know your color wheel, you'll be in better shape uh, for this game. But here is a little reference in case you don't know the color wheel. When you combine these two colors, like a blue and a yellow, you'll make green. When you combine a blue and a red, you'll make purple. When you combine a yellow and a red, you'll make orange. If you ever put together anything with a uh, secondary color, not a primary color, but a secondary color, that will dominate the situation and it will always stay that color. And so if you have colored dice and you combine them, like say I take these two dice and I play them on a card, this combination here would make green. But what if I don't want green? What if I want yellow? Well, then I could couple it with just a white die. Well, what if I don't have a white die, but I still need to make yellow? Well, I can turn this to a white die first if I want, or I could effectively uh, yeah, that, that would be how I would handle that. If I want to um, turn it into a specific color, I could make one of these a primary color like that. And so you're using these as kind of like these workers as color swatches to make the kind of color dye you're looking for. The other thing you can do is if the color dye matches, and by the way, it should be noticed, if you had like, for instance, this, you could turn this, this would turn this into a blue dye also. Okay, so it this makes that dye whatever the color it is. It doesn't mix. You couldn't make these two things a green because this would effectively turn that yellow into a blue. Okay, now you also, if the dye matches the exact color, it will make the dye value six. And so it is possible, for instance, if 
for you to turn to use two workers per die to make it a specific color and a six at the same time. And so you're using that little mechanic to try to aim for exactly what you're looking for here. Okay. So that isn't particularly too complex. However, I will say, I really wish there was a better player aid of how to do those things exactly than this specific little one card player aid, which kind of talks a little bit about that, but it doesn't tell you how to take each of the actions. It'd be nice to have that. That would make the game flow a lot easier, especially as you're learning it. All right. Now, how does the AI work in this game? Well, the AI works very simply in the fact that you flip over one of these cards and you take the action on the top if you can. If you can't, the action on the bottom is what you always take and it's always available to be taken. There's really a couple of main actions that you're dealing with here and they mimic what you will do. So the AI will um, employ translators. They'll translate scrolls, they'll deliver them, and then they'll also rest. They don't interact at all with the research track so you don't have to worry about that. And uh, they, they basically do things with rules that are similar, but adjusted to what you're doing. So that is the key there, adjusted to what you're doing. If they ever get to a point where they have three of the same card out here at the beginning of the turn, they will do a rest action like you will. And I'll tell you about a rest action in just a second. And that may trigger some things and advance the game, etc. Now the game ends when four, you could see three of the Caliph cards are out. When four of them come out, game ends, that's it. Okay, they come out from a deck that you seed in the beginning of the game, depending on the length you want. The casual game's a little shorter. The epic game is a little longer. And let me tell you, you're definitely going to play the casual game for the first game or two while you get the hang of things because uh, it just takes a little longer to learn and play this game than I've spent in other ones, at least in my opinion. Okay, so now that I've given you a pretty decent overview of what's going on, let's go ahead and demonstrate a couple turns so you see the flow of the game. So it is my turn right now. And again, we're, we're really in the kind of last quarter of the game, so to speak. We've seen three out of the four Calif cards. And so I am just kind of pressing through the situation. And I've taken one action this round already. Now, I think I want to do that translation that we we're just showing you earlier with the Greek, right? So in order to do that, I have to have an orange. Well, I don't have an orange. I have a yellow and I have some white, but I can make an orange. So what I'll do first is all of these cards that you have in your hand will have some kind of bottom modifier that will be an action you will take during the rest phase. And the game, you basically have a hand of six cards, which you unlock a seventh one, and you'll always keep those cards. So what I think I'd like to do, if at all possible, is make sure that I'm going to capitalize on the yellow, which I already have, and the green, which helps me go up another track. So I like this card for that standpoint, because at least here, at the end of the round, when I rest, I should say, I'm going up once in the primary track. So I'm going to put that here and then I'm going to put it over top of this situation here when it's where the translate is. Now, this would be a yellow nine. However, since I have this red worker, I can make this a red die and now this becomes orange. The nine doesn't matter, but the orange is important. So I can now translate this. Now, let's say his influence was on there. If his influence was on there, I'd have to pay him a coin from or a silver, pardon me, from my uh, supply. And he doesn't take coins, it would advance this little marker over here. And the more this marker goes around, the more benefits and such that he takes. But this isn't as punitive necessarily. It kind of moves things forward with him, um, getting him some more of these neutral cards he'll score and also putting some influence up there on the minarets. Okay, so what I'm basically going to do is I said I'm going to translate this. So we're going to pick it up. This influence is returned to me. And then I have to spend gold to get it from the Greek to the Arabic. All right, so how would I do that? Well, we gotta start in Greek. So I can start with him, Greek to Persian. And that's not so bad, except I have to pay him the gold to do it. But that's the way it is here. I could have tried to get somebody who translated Greek, maybe even to Arabic. I could have hired him first, but I'm doing this anyway in this, this uh, situation. So Greek to Persian, I pay him a gold, I put a gold on here. 
and then I have to pay him one coin. All right, so I pay him a coin, this moves forward. Now it's in Persian, I gotta go from Persian to Arabic. Well, I have my person right there, perfect. I could pay the gold. This is now successfully translated to Arabic. And then I put it above my tableau area here, okay? So what this does with the board area, this will score me two points at the end of the game, plus one point for every green translucent die that I have in my bag. If I have more than four or four or more blue dice, I'll also get two points. But why I really wanted to do this is for two reasons. Number one, when you do a, tr a translate contract, you immediately will move up on the research track shown here. That's also when you transfer one of these over to there. It's a little misleading. Shouldn't be. It's printed in the rule book. I get it, but still. So I'm going to move up there, which immediately lets me put an influence in the green, which is good because I didn't have anything there. And then I will get immediately one green die that I will add to my bag, making it easier for me to do green things in the future. Plus, that's one point guaranteed. So cool. Happy about that. Now, I retired her. So we're going to take these gold back, move the influence off of her, and then I'm going to pick a spot where she's going to go. And I'm probably going to put her over here in this side spot right now. That's what I'm going to do to enhance this uh, action over there. Now, I could have made some of these actions stronger if I wanted to, but I'm going to do it this way. I think that's just going to be the better situation for now. All right. Now, they do say you discard your workers to the supply, but I leave them here until I rest just because I want to remember, make sure if I ever make a mistake, how did I get the turn where it was supposed to be? So that's the end of my turn. And now we go to his turn. So what he's gonna do is he is going to play this card right here. So it shows a one coin, so that's gonna move one space. Then it says, if there are five or more translators over here, do this action. Well, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. So there's more than that. So that means it is going to place a, an influence token on one of the minarets. Well, how does it do it? It does it on any track first that um, doesn't have any of my influence on it. Then it'll place it on a track that um, doesn't have any of his influence on it. And then if there's ties like that, it'll just put it wherever the color is. In this case, the color focus here is green, so it'll go there. So it placed the influence. Then it's going to put a gold on the furthest left translator that is neutral. Okay, he won't put it on mine. He'll put on the first left one. So that's him. Why is it doing that? Why does that make sense? Well, because if it can get this person to retire, it will score these points at the end of the game. All right, so that's good. Okay, so his turn is done. Now notice he's going to rest in the next turn because he's got three cards of the same color out here. Now it comes back to me. I know that that's about to happen. He's going to rest. It is possible because I'm close to the end that the game may end right now. This might, this card, not right now, but, but in short order, because the card is coming up. So I've got that thought. And with that in mind, I'm going to see if I can press in some of these research spots a little bit more. So each of the research gives you points based on the level. One point down here, two points if you got to there, three, four, and five. Plus, I just enhanced this action. So I do want to take a research action. Now, the good news is I happen to have a blue here and I'm eyeing that blue spot anyway. So that is a plus. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, and I wanna make sure that I do get to take a crack at, let's see. I'd like to, to draw down my white dice if at all possible. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play this here. That gives me a five plus this is an eight. It's an eight blue, which is exactly what I wanted. So that's the best conversion I could do without having to pay gold. And I don't have a gold, so it's perfect. So I get the two silver. And then I'm going to move up on that track one space, which immediately tells me influence a minaret and influence one of these guild cards. The guild cards, eh, I, it's important. Um, I'm just not quite good enough at the game to know exactly what I want specifically, when I want it, etc. So I'm going to put the influence over here and we'll just see. That's another Greek one. Uh, it would be helpful. I guess the best thing to do would be to put one on one that I own. So if there was anything that was Chinese, 
I could do that, but he's already got the Chinese one, so oh well, Greek it is. Then, where do I want to put this? Well, I'd like to seize the majority away from him, so I'm going to put this over here. That doesn't seize it, so we're tied, but if I can get one more up there, I can get there at the end, and that would be good. The other thing I could do, which is probably better, actually I know it's better, is to play it on the purple, because here I'm going to score points at the end for that, so I'm going to do that. I'm tied there too, but I have a card that's going to at least help me out. All right. <clears throat> so that finished up my research action, but notice here on the bottom, I can take a blue die or a blue worker and add it to my bag. The plus means bag, the hand means hand. Well, I'm going to add it to the bag because that's what we say. The worker, the reason you might take a worker is because you can use it immediately if you want to on your turn. But any dice you get, whether it's the hand or the bag, you can't use it till the next turn. So that might be a reason why you take a worker versus something a little more permanent. Okay, now we go back to him. Well, I told you he's about to rest, right? So now we're gonna demonstrate the way the rest works. So what the rest does is it basically resets the situation that you've got going on. But the first thing you do is you deal the card off the bottom of the deck. And this one is not the end game card. So what's gonna happen here is we're going to see, we're going to first, um, no, what is this? That's weird. No, it's not. Never mind. I was, I was reading it wrong. So this is the victory point spot right here. I was looking for a silver spot like an idiot. This is the victory point spot here. So I'm going to move this neutral forward four spaces. One, two, three, four. The only purpose this thing really has is this mechanic you're going to see right here. So first we're going to see, is this card influenced by anyone or not? It's not, so that means this one is going to replace it. And then, since there are empty spaces over here, it's going to go in the first, furthest left empty space that's nearest the top, which is right there. Okay? So that is kind of how the game advances. It's drawing these cards down from the top and the bottom. The other way the game advances is every time you transfer a scroll over there, you're going to backfill over here. It's going to do the same thing. Now, what we do is we, um, so we revealed the bottom. Now we move the influence marker on the board left or right. And how do I do that? Well, you look at this key here and it says, if you had more red, you move it to the left. If you have more blue, you move it to the right. And I'm talking about the cards here. At the end of the game, you're going to compare this dice sum over here to what I'm going to do, which is going to be how many white dice versus colored dice do I have? And the white dice make it negative, the colored dice make it positive. And whoever has the highest sum is going to take two points. The lowest sum is going to get zero. So that's a little something at the end trying to balance it out. That's not a major thing I don't believe in a solo game from a point standpoint. At least it's just my own feeling about it, just a couple points. But a couple points could make the difference. So then we've done that. Now we go ahead and we gain the benefits past um, that it has on this, on this target here. Well, since it has one card showing here, it is not going to retire. Normally it would retire something out here. Uh, actually, retire something from the deck. It's not going to do that. It is going to place an influence on a Syriac card, if there is one, over here. I'm sorry, over here. It always wants to place an influence over here first. There is no Syriac card over here. So then what it's going to do is it's going to look to the next language, which is Chinese, and then Sanskrit. So there is a Sanskrit. So then it will look to which one is in the color preference. I think it's color preference. It might be the which ones are whatever, high or lowest. But it's let me look that up because this is important from placing influence. So influence... This is the one thing that is, there's a lot of these little things in here, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, yeah, so when you put on this there, you want to interact with the scroll. No, it's influence on the scroll. When influencing the scroll, they always focus in the House of Wisdom first. They will only look at the map. All right. And if the House of Wisdom, they will use the same focus rules as translating. So translating has to do with the... Uh, what's the thing? So, goodness. 
it's I'm gonna well, we're not gonna waste time on it right now. It's either this one or this one. There's probably a color element to it, but that would be green, so it's not on the green. So it's gonna be this one, okay? Because I know it in there it says it's on the lowest guild at some level when you're comparing. Because that's the one that's uh, I'm not sure exactly why that makes any difference. Anyway, sorry I'm rambling, apologize. So there it takes its turn. Now it is going to reset these actions. And so all it's gonna do, it's gonna shuffle these cards back into the discard, into its draw pile. And it has three of each, and there we go. So you kind of see an example. I'm not gonna play any more turns right here because you. I think you get a good idea of what you're trying to do in this game. You're, you're making these linkages, translating these cards. The cards, when you score them here, are all circumstantial to what they score on. There is a ton of different things to keep track of in this game. They're fun things, don't get me wrong but there's a ton of things. Each of these cards, for instance, scores in a different way. There's a lot of them. Now, there, there are duplicates here, so you can double or triple up on your stuff if you can hone your strategy, if you can see it. Um, but, and you won't see all the cards in any given game, but there it is. It's, it's, there's a lot to consider, I'll put it that way. All right, so let me go ahead and tell you what I think about it. Okay, so that should help you get a good idea of the gameplay mechanics of Scholars of the South Tyrus. Now, one of the things I didn't show you was how I rested, but basically it's similar in the fact that you draw the card from the bottom, you resolve it if it's a, uh, you know, depending on the type of card it is, and then you will gain income from left to right, activating your research tracks. And I should have demonstrated that, but basically it's a way to... Um, Kind of reap the benefits of the cards you played and get the track income that you're looking for and then you basically put all the dice you've spent um well you, you draw out new dice from the bag based on your last research track roll those put the other ones you spent back in the bag and it's kind of a nice reset step uh, but what it's a little bit more i would say compared to it, it, it because you're choosing the cards you play you have a little bit more involvement on what that reset set uh so that rest step looks like every time versus, you know, the way I felt about it with regards to um, Wayfarers of the South Tigris, for instance. But either way, the other thing that I have to point out here quickly is that, and this is something that's important, like I said, the solo player does not follow the rules like you do. They do specifically what it says in the rule book, whether it breaks the rules of the game or not. So, for instance, when it goes to translate a... Um, uh, a scroll, if there happen to be no translators at all down on the bottom, it will still translate, okay? Or if there happen to be translators with none of the matching languages or it doesn't get back to Arabic or whatever the situation is, it will still translate. You gotta follow the steps. And so that was very confusing to me. And I'll say this, I, first of all, I really like this game. It's a fantastic game. I'll get back to that in just a second. But I had a very hard time learning this game. And I don't know what it is, but it seems like even though I really enjoy and keep most of the Shem Phillips games that I've played, boy, do I have a hard time learning them. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the way the rule book is written. They don't stick with me. I had to read the rule book twice and then even watch a playthrough and then finally just get down to playing it and then going back to the rules until it finally started to click. And that's where my biggest criticism of the game comes. I wish with a game that's not language independent, like this one is not language independent, they just throw in a couple better uh, player aids to help you figure out exactly how to take the actions. Now, I printed out a player aid from Board Game Geek. This one came from user uh, Melly Babe, maybe, I guess. Anyway, there's his name there. This helped me do the execution of the solo a lot easier. It filled in a lot of the gaps and that was great. But I didn't have that for my own situation. And so it was, it took me a lot longer. It took me probably twice as long to play the game as I should have because I felt like I was still very much learning it throughout the first two thirds of the game. Once it clicked, then it started to make some more sense. But for whatever reason, I just struggle with the rules. I struggle with the execution of the rules. The rules are pretty clear in themselves, but it's somehow it's just the way it's written. Anyway, that aside, I think this game is awesome. I think it is so much fun. There's so much to track. There's so much to think about. I should say track is 
not the right word. It's not so much to track. There's so many things to consider. And that makes every game really feel like a joy to play and very different. And I love that. And that's great. Also, they did, I believe they did a much better job with the solo bot this time. The It has four different difficulty levels, but on the lowest level, I didn't feel like I was getting slaughtered, you know. Um, it, it feels like it might be, it'll be a lot less swingy. Um, and it'll just, it just feels like they improved the design based on that compared to Wayfarers of the South Tigris. Now, I will say this. I like the fact, and I appreciate the fact, that the solo bots are in both of these games. Because otherwise, I wouldn't be able to play them. So don't take that criticism about swinginess or whatever. I, I just think this one's better. And I still have and still love, never won, but still love to play uh, Wayfarers of the South Tigris. But I get, I get clobbered every time. I'm not really looking to win that game when I play it, although that would be nice. But here, you definitely have a chance. You definitely have a chance, and it feels a little bit more cohesive, which I like. Um, and luckily, the, the type of actions they're taking, the solo bot is taking, is much more um, limited to just a couple different things. So you really can focus on your own strategy, which you really need to, versus having to focus on what is the bot actually doing. It's, it's manageable. But again, I needed that player aid to help me to do it. Uh, the player aids were, weren't, at least they were present, which was good. They just I just needed a little bit more to fill in the gaps to help me really learn the system. Either way, this one gets very high marks for me. I really enjoyed it, and I appreciated the designer's feedback, uh, answering a couple questions I had on Board Game Geek when I posted them. It is definitely a good game. It's a great game for the solo player, uh, and I don't really have a lot bad to say about it besides the challenge I had of learning it and executing it. That will absolutely go away as you learn and you play more games for sure. Uh, but... Either way, this is a fantastic game. I hope you can check it out. And either, and if, if you don't like it or you didn't look like the, the way it looks like, you thought it was going to be too much, that's okay too. But if you do check it out, I think you'll be in for a treat. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate everybody. And whatever you decide to do in the future, I really hope you have a fantastic time doing it. Take it easy.